Hello everybody. Welcome to our discussion of chapter 14. We are going to dive into business unit performance measurement. Um, just recall that we've already talked about how business units are organized, whether they be cost centers, profit centers, investment centers, um, because that's important as to how we evaluate them. As we look at the evaluation uh, processes in this chapter, they're going to make sense more so with investment centers than, for instance, cost centers or something like that. So uh, we'll point that as we go along, but that's important to remember and recall back to that idea that we've already gone over. So remember, we're trying to balance our management control systems. And one of the things we were trying to do with that is performance measurement. So our, our performance measurement in balance with the rest of our management control, does it consistent with the decision authority of the manager? Meaning, are they being evaluated based on the level and the decisions that they can make? Uh, those things that they have no control over or can't make a decision about shouldn't be part of or at least should be clearly um, not a important comp component of that evaluation okay uh, and when they do a good job does that reflect in a way that will also help the company or organization move forward okay um, and are there situations where they may our performance evaluation could look good for them and not so good for the company it might be actually uh, hindering our goals so are we in alignment and are there any incentives in our system that would actually be disincentives, meaning things that they would want to do that will actually end up being uh, a problem for the organization. So the first one we're going to talk about briefly would be a profit center focus. This is where we have revenues and expenses that we have control over. Okay, so we just take our divisional revenues minus division costs. Relatively straightforward, easy to use. Um, if you've done your accounting correctly, and the, this is kind of the assumption all of these make, is do we have a good way of uh, dividing up or separating costs? So if you look at this Western Division, Eastern Division, sales revenue, cost of sales, so forth, for each division, we're kind of assuming that we have the mechanism in place to be able to separate sales revenue from for the Western Division from the Eastern Division. And so that has to have been thought of beforehand. And that sometimes I run into with uh, companies, they want to do this after the fact, meaning they didn't set up their accounting system to track it separately, but they want to go back and figure that out. And that makes it much more difficult, much more uh, messy. So if we go into it understanding that this is what we want to do, uh, then it will not be overly difficult at the end of the accounting period to be able to do this. Now, I would argue that this divisional income statement has a problem, and that is the allocated corporate overhead. So unless there's a good, clear, cost driver scenario where the Western division, okay, needs greater resources from the corporation, from the corporate overhead than the Eastern division. Now, looking at it here is probably based on sales. And yes, the Western division sales revenue is higher than the Eastern division. But what is it about those sales that makes the corporate overhead higher for the Western division? That's what the manager of the Western Division is going to want to understand. If we can make that distinction and that argument, 
then I don't see a problem with allocating corporate overhead if you have a good tie to that. But when it doesn't or it's hard to see or understand or we haven't bothered to even look at it, then it doesn't seem very uh, motivating to okay, allocate based on sales this allocated corporate overhead. First of all, it could be detrimental to our uh, organization if they look at increased sales as also increasing overhead allocation that they have no control over other than increasing sales. So they may hesitate to increase sales for that reason. So and that would not necessarily be a good thing overall as a company. Now, looking at local advertising, that makes a lot more sense. That has that local thing. This is where we're advertising within our region. Now, of course, any type of campaign is going to spill over into other regions, but we can see where we advertise, what we did to do that, and base our evaluation on the fact that we used a greater amount in the Western Division than the Eastern Division. But again, we had to have set that up so that when we negotiate our, our contracts and everything, that there is a delineation between the Western Division advertising and the Eastern Division, and you're always going to have some some, what about national advertising, things that go national? If you have that, then of course you, that's a, an allocated corporate overhead, okay? And again, you're kind of stuck with how do you allocate that and is there a good, if, is there a good um, way to trace that cost to that particular division? And I would also uh, probably leave off most of the time on these internal uh, decision-making tools, uh, taxes, uh, just because it doesn't really end the control of the Western Division at all what the tax rate is. Now, as long as you use the same tax rate across all divisions, then it really doesn't make a difference in any decisions you make. So you can use it. It doesn't distort what it looks like, but it, it's just one more com complexity that probably isn't meaningful for this evaluation. So there's some real advantages to this divisional income, assuming you have it set up correctly, okay? Uh, easy to understand. We only reflect or try to reflect the decisions controlled by the manager, okay? Um, you can see it. You, you compare your actual revenues with your actual expenses, and you can look see each one who made the most income as far as comparisons. Missing missing issue or problem disadvantage with this is it has no reflection of how big or how many resources each division has so we don't know if they sold more just because they have twice as many outlets or because they've actually been more efficient all right so nothing about assets nothing about the decisions with regard to investment is reflected because it is for a profit center, not for an investment center. Once, once you reach the level of decision making that is investment center, then you need, because you have control over not just revenues and expenses, but also how much you have in the way of assets, then you have, should consider those assets in our evaluation uh, process. So, just some things you would use if you were using the accounting uh, re re income to help, you know, figure out some ratios that might, that might help us make that decision. All right, moving to per more commonly or more, uh, maybe a, a little more complicated because it involves assets. Return on assets, again, return on investment or return on investment, same thing. Uh, after in tax income, or you can use before tax income, uh, I would argue probably a better measure, divided by divisional assets. So you've got 
not just the income you have to calculate, you also have to look at how many assets or what, how much dollar amount assets does, the, does this division control? What do they use? This allows us to compare different size in far as resources are concerned. So that might look like this. We may have to not only have the divisional income statement, we also would ha might have to divide up our assets. Now, in real life, the revenues and expenses are probably easier than the assets many times, okay? Um, and again, only if we uh, were actually pretty good at setting up when we bought the assets, which division they belong to, make this easier. Now, this can go, you can go back and kind of re-identify, move assets from one to another if they get used by one division or the other. Uh, and because assets are a snapshot in time, we can, we can move them uh, a way that is a little easier than revenues and expenses because there's not as many transactions. But again, it's easier if you know this going in, right? Now, in this case, okay, this balance sheet, they're going to use the total assets, all of the assets. Now, that assumes things like you can actually divide up accounts receivable and that sort of thing between the two divisions. Now, remember our concept of um, decentralization versus centralization. Accounts receivable and cash management may be two things that you handle entirely at the corporate level. If that's the case, then those assets are corporate assets, not division assets. And therefore, it could be a little more complicated to figure out what is our divisional ones. And of course, inventory should be a little more obvious because that's the stuff we're selling in that particular division located in a particular place. Because inventory is, has a physical presence, it needs to be located according to that as the fixed assets, equipment, buildings, that sort of thing. Uh, accounts receivable isn't have a location. Cash doesn't, in today's world, doesn't have a location. It can be moved all over the world. So the trend is to utilize more of just the assets that can actually be identified in a particular um, di division. And so we take the after tax income or income before taxes um, and divide it by those divisional assets to get return on investment. Okay, so if you separated out the assets by division, separate the revenues and expenses by division, you can make these calculations. And you see that there is a slight uh, difference, 24% for the Eastern Division, 22 for the Western Division. So just how this breaks down um, when you're looking at improving return on investment, you have the piece, which is the after-tax income divided by sales. That's profit margin ratio. Could we sell it, our product for a lot more than we paid for it, basically? Um, and, and then the other half of it is sales divided by assets or asset turnover. And so if you're a manager and you're trying to improve your return on investment, you can uh, work on the profit margin ratio or the asset turnover ratio. Now, if you're really, really good, you can work on both at the same time, but they're sometimes hard to do both at the same time. Meaning if you're trying to increase your price or lower your cost, that sometimes can be very focusing compared to reducing your assets or, or increasing the turnover of your assets, of how much you use your assets. So often it's necessary to kind of narrow your focus a little bit. And that is the problem or limitation of return on investment. It can be short term. This is not looking over a five or six year period. This is looking right now at our net income 
divided by the assets, okay? So we could have a situation where, as a manager, we may do some things that would improve our return on investment, but might long-term be not good for the company. For instance, when the one that it gets utilized a lot is if your return on investment is based on income, income revenues minus expenses divided by assets, then, then to improve that, you may be tempted to not complete certain repairs and maintenance on your equipment. And so as soon as the equipment is actually running fine, it's just that we say, oh, we don't need to do that maintenance on that equipment this year. That cost won't go on the income statement. That means our return on investment will look higher for this year. But that may fall apart next year. It may cause quality issues even this year. It could cause morale, morale issues amongst our employees as they have to work with, uh, you know, equipment that's not working right or they have to do extra work because it's not properly maintained uh, or they're having to maintain it on the fly, if you will, by doing it during their shift. Uh, so it's kind of hidden, that, but it's still being done. It just shows up in lower production. All of those things are things that you might be tempted to do if you are too myopic, meaning you're focused just on return on investment, this short-term measure, uh, and that sort of thing. You also may be very concerned about investing in more assets that may pay off down the road, but aren't going to improve our return on investment right now, because remember, you're always looking at not just the income, but also the assets. So if buying a new asset increases the asset base and therefore could reduce your return on investment if it's not a successful investment. Makes you a little more risk averse than you might otherwise be, okay? So if you're going to improve return on investment, you gotta increase sales, decrease costs, we talked about that already, or decrease assets. And sometimes they can, the shortcut, if you will, of those three is the decrease assets push them out the door or something like that. Um, find ways to do with less, which can be fine for a time, but can lead to problems down the road. Now, here's the type of decision that can get sub-optimized, meaning the problem with how the manager looks at it versus the company. So the company has this situation where their return on their... Um, cost of capital is 20%, meaning they want to do any project that makes 20% or more, okay? So, but the Western Division has been successful and has consistently been able to do 22%. So a project comes along that makes 21%. The Western Division is going to look at that as a problem. That is going to actually lower the Western Division's return on investment overall, okay? Because they're gonna average, okay, uh, the two together and they're gonna get something lower than 22%. It's gonna lower that. And the Eastern Division would look even worse at that, right? They would look at it uh, and say, wow, that's that even more so going to reduce our overall return on investment. And so we'll pass on that 21%. Now, in both cases, the company would be better off by doing those projects because the company wants to make 20%. And everything over 20% should be completed. And that these two managers just passed on ones that were 21 because they didn't meet their local goal of 22 or 24% based on what they have done in the past, okay? So that is a conflicting incentive. Something where the, the individual managers have a issue or are going to be tempted at least to not 
go with something that would actually make the organization better off. So that's just the problem you need to understand with return on investment. That can be an issue. When you use that, they are going to look at that return of 21% and think that is not good enough. That's especially if you use return on investment uh, improvement as a measure, meaning you got to do as well as you did last year or better. That's even more dangerous because now they really have very little incentive uh, to take on projects that aren't gonna uh, that are gonna be aren't gonna be higher than what they did last year. So there's a second measure, residual income, which seeks to reduce that problem. Okay, so it's gonna take the profit that the company makes after you cover the cost of capital. So basically, this is the amount that you needed to get the assets that you needed, and but you were able to earn more than that. That's what residual income is. So the formula, again, is income. I mean, they say after tax, I'd say pre-tax, okay? Minus the cost of capital. So, and that's not a measure that we are going to delve into deeply as far as how it's calculated. We'll just be given that, but it's a cost to, to get the assets from the stockholders and from other lenders, all right? The cost of capital times our divisional assets. And we talked about how to determine those assets a little earlier. So if you can make more income than the cost of the assets, then you have residual income. If you can't, then you should, I mean, if you can't do it on the long run, you shouldn't be in business. Uh, and you need to reevaluate re your goals and such. So this is kind of the idea that you would how you would apply it. So we take the restaurant division, we know our income, we know our investment in assets, we multiply by the cost of capital. And so the organization can designate the cost of capital you use for everybody. So now both the Western Division and Eastern Division are using the same cost of capital. So the Western Division's cost of their assets is 300,000. They make 336,000. So their residual or the amount over the cost of the assets is 36. The Eastern Division, same calculation with 34.2. Now, as long as the project is going to make more than 20%, we're on board, both in the Western Division and Eastern Division, because all I need to do is not beat last year, not beat my Eastern Division, just beat the cost of capital that the company has stated and figured out. Now, the third measure, economic value added, is a modification to residual income. So it's gonna feel very much like residual income. You also are going to take the uh, cost of capital times a measure of assets, and then you're gonna look at your income and see if it's over that to decide if you have added economic value. So residual income, the excess over what it costs for the assets, economic value added a more sophisticated, a more complex way to calculate how much more that you made versus the cost of the assets that um, you have been using. So we're gonna, to get economic value added, we're going to adjust our formula our residual income formula to try to eliminate what uh, consultants have said are accounting distortions. All right, and we'll show you a couple of those. The textbook explains some of those, but basically we're gonna adjust 
all of the pieces that we use in our formula for the calculating the after-tax income. All right, we're going to use the same cost capital, but also we're going to adjust divisional assets to get economic value added. But it's going to feel very much like the residual income. So here's an example of something that many people believe is a distortion to uh, in our accounting process. They say that advertising or marketing in general is not an expense. It really is an asset. It really provides benefit into the future. In accounting, we have decided that that future benefit is so uncertain that we don't record it as an asset. But internally, we don't have to follow those accounting rules. And this is all done internally. So as a manager, you say, okay, my, my marketing expense is not really an expense. It's actually an investment. It's an asset. That asset is going to go, if it, go on the balance sheet, not on the income statement. And it's going to be used up um, over the next two years. So instead of putting it all in year one or all in the year that we pay for it, which is the way we do it in accounting, we're going to take it and spread it over two or three years, in this case, two years. All right. So this is not GAAP. This is not how um, we learn to do it in earlier accounting classes, this is entirely for internal decision-making purposes only. Okay, so if that's the case, then there was expenses you spent on marketing last year that also need to be partially used up this year. Okay, so it starts to get a little more complicated you see in this example, and this is just the one adjustment to advertising. So Western Division adds back all the advertising first and then subtracts the used up part of the advertising from last year and part of the used, the, the used up part from the current year. So that's where the 400 and 300 came from. So instead of 1,200 of advertising, we're actually subtracting to get net income 700. That means our adjusted income is not is 836,000. Okay. Now, on the asset side of things, we also then if we're counting advertising as an asset, then it's got to be included in our assets and our investment. So that, as we remember uh, in our formula, affects the, uh, the whole calculation, right? Because we're trying to look at the amount of economic value we added in addition to what our cost of our assets were. Well, the more assets you have, the higher the cost of those assets. So our division investment we take out current liabilities often because they do not cost in the terms of investment. They don't cost interest. So usually the term is non-interest bearing uh, liabilities are not included to the extent in our divisional investment because we didn't have to pay for it, those. And then we, but we then have to add so you see the 1500 that's the that was the all the assets we took out the current liabilities cuz they don't have interest and then we add the unamortized advertising the part of the advertising that we haven't used up yet so we can't just adjust the net income because of advertising we also have to adjust the assets okay and so now we have changed both numbers Okay, the net income, the total assets, 
The only one we haven't changed is the cost of capital. Okay, so we take our adjusted income based on those adjustments we talked about earlier and any other adjustments, and then we subtract out the 20% of our assets, right? Because we still have a cost of capital. All the assets we have cost us 20%. Did we make more than what it cost us? And this answer question is being answered in this situation. Economic value added of 486.4 in the Western Division and 289.2 in the Eastern Division. Again, we're probably not going to use these as comparisons, saying that the East Western Division is, you know, that much better than the Eastern Division, um, because we this. Uh, isn't a good way to do that, but uh, given that you know certain limitations, it can indicate that the Western Division is providing more economic value than the Eastern Division because we've already considered the size of the assets used in the Western and Eastern Division. So what's our pr problems with this? Well, first of all, you can do all kinds of accounting distortion adjustments and who gets to decide which those are. That's not as important as being consistent if you're going to get making comparisons. Okay, so you can get around that accounting distortions by limiting them to those that you feel are the most important and being consistent about them. Okay. It is still a short-term measure. It is not a long-term. It does not consider the present value of cash flows. It does not look out four or five years to decide whether this asset is going to provide cash flows that will justify its original cost. So it is still a short-term measure, just like return on investment, just like residual income. All right, some things that come up when calculating this these any of these measures okay so we've got to measure accounting income we've got to measure assets or what resources should you use the historic cost of the assets the gross book value meaning what we originally paid for it even though we're depreciating it over time or should we subtract out the depreciation so that our assets are going down each year should we use what we originally paid or some estimate of what the value of those assets is today? Current cost. Should we average the beginning and the ending together? Should we use what you were at, in the middle of the year? Should you just use the ending balance? Should we just skip, quit all this averaging just get together? All of these are questions that you need to answer if you're going to measure and have a good, and it needs to be clear. The manager needs to understand how they're going to be measured and what's going to be used so that they know how to respond and do their very best. Okay, so here's some examples of how this plays out depending on which decision you make. Okay, our example Profits before depreciation, without any depreciation, okay, are $100 for each year. Asset cost at the beginning of year one is $500. We are making an assumption about depreciation and everything is in thousands. So here's this year one with your return on investment. You started the, the, Income before depreciation was 100, and this is a calculation of depreciation, right? Because it's 10 year asset, so 0.1 or 10% is going to be depreciated each year. So the depreciation will be 50. That reduces our income, but it also reduces our assets. And you'll see that in year two, the assets go down again, and the year three goes down again. And even though your income hasn't changed, your return on investment is actually going up because you are showing 
fewer and fewer assets, right? Because they're being depreciated. Gross book value keeps the 500 the whole time. We just treat it, we don't treat, we treat it as if it didn't get subtracted from the assets. That's what we originally paid for them, that's what we use. All right, so you can see the issue with both of them. On one side, the issue is regardless of what you do, you're going to increase your return on investment just because your assets are getting used up. On the other one, you see that you just ignore that whole phenomenon, pretending that even after years and years, your assets are still as effective as they were when you first bought them. So both of them have weaknesses. Now, obviously, you need to be consistent. You can't make a comparison if you do one for one division and another for the other division. But even if you make that decision, you still need to understand what the limitations are. And there's not really a good answer to get rid of those limitations, uh, just that they need to be understood. Should you use the current cost, which would be an estimate, not something that you can uh, be as objective about, or historical cost, what you originally paid for it? Okay, so again, an example, okay? So this situation, the asset is actually going up in value, and so is the amount we're making because we have inflation, okay? In this case, pretty serious inflation, 20%. So the asset starts at 500, okay? It's depreciating from an accounting standpoint, but its value is incre increasing because of inflation. So you see that if you use the net book value, again, you increase return on investment each year not because you did anything better, but just because the business has higher profits because of inflation. All right? And because the asset is being depreciated, okay? If you estimate the current cost all, all along, you see that our profits are also going up with inflation, but so is the depreciation amount because the asset is also growing. So it's because of inflation. All right, and so you dampen, you still have this increase, but it's not near as much as it would be with historical costs because you're actually looking at and saying, okay, profits are increasing because of inflation, but so is the value of our assets. All right. Um, here the situation is, okay, we're going to keep it at the original historic cost in terms of depreciation. You see the depreciation is the same every year, right? Our profit is going up. So our, using this, our return on investment goes up even though we haven't really done anything. And then this is, this gets us a situation where the, pro, the profits are increasing. So is the depreciation because we're also in, assuming a, increase in the value of the assets that offset that so you see that every year is the same return which is perhaps the most you know the, the the best measure of the situation because literally we as a business haven't done anything better the only reason we have higher profits is inflation assets going up because of inflation None of that is within our control. Uh, and so we have tried to take those inflation effects out. And by doing that, year one, year two, year three, have the same return on investment because we did the same thing. Okay? 
Should you use beginning, ending, or average? There's no right answer, okay? Um, if you use ending, a uh, manager can manipulate it by selling the asset right before year end, or that they could be punished for buying it right at the year end, where if you use an average, you, it kind of uh, mutes that. If you use the beginning, that was what they had all year long, but it ignores any investment. So it's, again, not a right answer. You need to understand the limitations on each one. And no matter how good you are with this, how many tweaks you make to the assets or the calculation of income, none of them allow the, you to consider what the division for the decision for one division has on other divisions. See, because we're separating them there are interactions in almost all, especially if they're selling products one to another, that really may, can be measured when you are limited to these measurement tools. So while these are helpful tools, they should not be the only pieces of information. The, the sum total of our performance for valuation, there has to be some other pieces.